Good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. I am Pastor Richard T. Wade, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today. I pray the Word of God can speak to you, and the Holy Spirit make it real to you. Now, a pre-recorded message from Cornerstone Assemblies of God. This morning's title is Perfect and Complete. Perfect and Complete. We joked about putting a picture of Jim Davenport on there. (laughs) Perfect and Complete. Those are two words that make most people very nervous. But I'm going to start out my message with the end of my message. And I'll, before I get there, I just want to say, good morning. You're a good-looking group of people this morning. There's a few of you been out and about, and so we're glad to have you back. And then there's some visitors, and so it's glad to have y'all. And so we're just glad to have you. And glad that more of you have got back in the swing of things. I, it's summer. I'm not, I'm not passing any judgment. The preacher ain't being ugly. Y'all like going vac I like to go on vacation. I ain't missing too I ain't doing it no more. And so I'll go on vacation, but I ain't missing Sunday no more. Unless I'm on the mission field. I just it don't feel right. It don't feel right. But this morning, perfect and complete. And you're thinking, preacher, I, I, I can't be perfect. And I, I know I'm not complete. I'm lacking this. I'm lacking that. Well, I'm going to say this to you. Stop it. Stop it. Stop declaring defeat. Stop it. Perfect and complete. You know who is perfect and complete? Jesus. You know who I am hidden in and who is in me and who you are hidden in and who is in you? Jesus. And so if I'm in Jesus and Jesus is in me, then through him, I am perfect and complete. You are perfect and complete. Do we all fall short of the glory of God? Why, sure we do. Does that give us a license to do it on purpose? No, it does not. I was thinking this morning while brushing my teeth, just... You don't need that information, but that's when this thought come to me. I was sitting there brushing my teeth, and this popped in my mind. It's not in my notes, but I wasn't planning on saying it. (laughs) But declaring all my faults all the time and focusing on all the areas that I've got wrong, all that does is exaggerate those areas. Focus on the solution. You know, uh... (laughs) Focus on who Jesus is and what he's done. Focus on him being perfect and complete. And renew your mind with his word and and find yourself in his presence and begin to do the word that he gives you when you find yourself in his word. And as you're pondering on the solution, he transforms your mind. He begins to cleanse you. He begins to make you desire things he desires. He begins to make you say and do things that he says and does. It's very much like spending time with people. You can tell when you're around certain people. You know, uh, you spend time around negative Nancys, you get negative. You spend time around positive Polly's and... You're positive. I don't know why it's always women names, but, you know. (laughs) But you can tell. You can tell with your kids at school. Uh, Last year, of course, y'all, I'm not going to give Cooper's story this morning, really, but an example. You know, you know that he struggles with making the right choices. Um, in the day-to-day world, not, but anyway, he was making some really bad choices last year, first semester. And I'd beat him a half a dozen times, and 
it didn't really seem to be doing any good and I began to ground him and it still wasn't doing any good and so I began to add a mixture you know three licks and six days of grounding and then we'll end the six days of grounding with three more licks to remind you why you got grounded in the first place that didn't work either and then I began to take stuff from him he didn't have no guns he didn't have no knives he could he don't have a gaming station. I can't take that from him. He likes to cut down trees and shoot a pistol. And so I took his, you know, hatchet away from him. And make, I wouldn't, I hope this stays this way with him. I stopped allowing him to mow the yard. He couldn't mow the yard anymore. <laughs> That's what happened, Jim. That's it. You know, Cooper got grounded from mowing. <laughs> but it wasn't working and his actions were getting worse not better and so the principal called me I went to the school visited with her visited with his teacher and we weren't getting anywhere I went back to the school visited with them again and uh, Miss Tammy in the office she pulled me over to the side and she says I love Cooper she says, he does make some bad choices, but he's precious. She says, and I'm not placing blame on anybody else because it's his responsibility to make the right choices. She says, but I would check on who he's playing with at recess because he's fine in the morning. He goes to lunch and recess, and then in the evenings, his day falls apart. See what's taking place at lunch and recess. So I began to quiz him. Who are you eating lunch with? Who are you playing with? What new friend did you get? I don't want to know their name, what they're doing, what do y'all talk about, what games are you playing? And then as I got to realize what all was going on, I found the problem. I said, son, I'm not telling you to be mean or ugly to anybody, but what I am telling you is for henceforth and forevermore. You don't play with that kid no more. You don't eat lunch with them. You don't play. But what? they're my friend. You tell them, I'm sorry, but my daddy said. I said, put all the blame on me. Don't eat lunch at that table. Don't play with them on the playground. And do you know almost immediately... It wasn't perfect. He's still Cooper. <laughs> but those really exaggerated issues almost immediately ceased. Because it was influence. It's his responsibility. He made the wrong choices. This isn't me play. But his influence give him opportunities to make decisions. That other influence would not never allow. And so I'm sharing these things with you this morning, setting this scene because I'm brushing my teeth. And I had this thought talking about perfect and complete. And if I only ever focus on me not going to get it right so I don't even try to get it right, is about like my weight loss, which you can see I'm not real good, but I mean I've lost a little bit and praise the Lord for it, you know, but... That's the reason I can wear slacks again. <laughs> I, I was put those blue jeans on because I you know, outgrew all my slacks. <laughs> outgrew it like I'm in the 10th grade or something, you know. And so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like getting up in the morning and saying, Lord, I know I need to lose weight for my health and to be obedient to you for your call. I know that, that you've laid this on my heart as a place of conviction for me personally to lose weight. I know that, but God, I also know that I'm probably going to mess up today, so I'm just going to start out my morning at the donut shop, and I'm going to round lunch up with a cheesy chimichanga, and I'm going to go ahead and have pizza for dinner, and a molten lava cake at Chili's sounds delicious, because I know I'm going to mess up anyway, so I might as well go on ahead and just start the day out right you know what ain't never gonna happen I ain't never gonna lose weight matter of fact I'm gonna gain it 
But at least in the morning I can say, God, I know you're calling me to lose weight. I know this is a personal conviction. God, I choose today I'm going to fast until at least 1 p.m. just to tell my body it ain't eating nothing. Now, at 5 o'clock in the evening, I still might go buy Domino's and get me an extravaganza with extra meat sauce and a 2-liter Coca-Cola, but at least I started my day out right. And what I mean by that is, is think about that in your spiritual mind. God, I know that your mercies are new this morning. I know that your grace is sufficient. I know that you are calling me to holiness. I know that you are calling me to be pleasing unto you and to be a witness to a lost and a hurting world. And so today, God, I'm starting out my morning to please you and to worship you. I'm going to go ahead and take five minutes and read a few scriptures. I'm going to go ahead and listen to a podcast and some worship music on my way to work this morning. I'm going to go ahead and get my mind right. Now, I might miserably fail at 3 o'clock this evening, but I'm going to start out pleasing God. And then when that failure happens at 3, don't think that you got to just keep failing God for the rest of the day. That's when you say, Lord, I don't know why I did this because I don't want to do this. I know I shouldn't have done it. I know better. But God, forgive me and help me at least finish my day strong and pleasing to you. Do you see the difference in the focus? I'm focusing on Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my source. Jesus is my righteousness. And because he's my righteousness, I am righteous. Just because I failed doesn't mean I can't be righteous in the next breath. Because if I'm truly repentive, he'll cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. It's our focus. What are we focusing on? What are we, because I know people, well, we all fall short of the sin of God. Our righteousness is but a filthy rags. Yes, that's true. But if that's your mindset when you first wake up in the morning, so you just go ahead and give yourself a license to fail God in every area of your life on purpose, that's called habitual sin. You can't stay long, save long doing that. I know I'm meddling now. So this morning, I want to encourage you that you're perfect and complete if you're in Christ Jesus. And focus on the perfection and the completion of Christ and allow him to finish the work. that he. Because see, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So he started a work within you. And if you don't quit and you stay focused on him and you declare his promises and you declare his word, he's going to finish that faith in you. But if you quit mid-stride and just decide you've stumped your toes, so you better just quit running the race altogether. I'd rather run a race and finish it with a limp than not finish it at all. Something uh, Pastor K. Rich, he said it years ago as my associate pastor in one of those messages. I love it when, you know, you listen to your associates and staff pastors and they preach something. You think, whoo, I ain't going to let him preach no more because he preached that better than I did. You know what I mean? And He preached... uh, about striving toward Christ and he said that every day he just hopes to continue to stumble toward Christ and that picture that he painted is not saying that there's not going to be mess ups and and shortcomings and all but as long as I'm stumbling toward Christ just keep dusting yourself off and keep sometimes you might be in that old army crawl but just keep on Don't quit, don't stop, and for sure don't turn around. I have to sing the old Nancy Harmon song to myself. I've come too far to turn back, you know. And so, amen. Some people are like, I don't know who Nancy Harmon. Y'all look up Sister Nancy Harmon. She's good. I think she's still alive. Uh, I I mean, I I know she was sick. Uh, She was alive just a year or so ago. I think she's still alive. But that woman can sing. She wrote a song also called Blood Bought Church. Look that one up. Whew, that'd take you to town. Nancy Harmon on Spotify is going to go through the roof tonight because I said that in Jesus' name. (laughs) Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, I want to read you just a few verses. Verses 7, 8, and 9. And... There's you, you're going to read part of it and you're going to think, uh-oh, he's telling us to listen to him. No, that's actually not the part I'm going to talk about. 
but it's just in this verse. I can't get to the second half of the verse without reading the first half of the verse. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you and who have proclaimed to you the word of God. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. Follow their faith. Considering the results it has produced in their lives. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. It is a good thing that your heart be strengthened with grace and not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. I'm not going to talk about going on a diet. That'd be too hard on you. But in verse 7, for those who have proclaimed the word of God to you, follow their faith. But that's not what I want to talk about you either. Considering the results it has produced in their lives. When I read that, I'm reading out of the modern English version. When I read that phrase, the Holy Spirit just dug about as far down deep in my spirit as he can dig. And kind of just did one of those swirly do's and gouged while he was down there. And, you know, when you go to the dentist and they, you know, got this little sharp thing and they're scraping on your gums and gouging on your teeth saying, does this hurt? Well, who does it not hurt? I mean, you've just inserted a piece of steel a half inch into my gums. Yeah, it hurts. Well, that's kind of what God did to me. Because this is where this whole message derived from. Because I'm going to pose this to you. What are you giving people to follow? Because whomever wrote the letter to the Hebrews, which are Jewish Christians, um, for years I believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Many give him credit for writing it. But in the last 40 to 50 years, that has been questioned and with some decent proof. And so, I don't know, maybe Paul did write it, maybe he didn't. But I know it was God-breathed and God-ordained, so I really don't care who the man was that penned it. So, you know, <laughs> anyhow, so whomever, the writer of Hebrews, in writing this, is writing to the Jewish Christians and he's telling them, look, you need, when it says rule over you, he's not talking about the government. They're talking, he's talking to the church. He's saying, look, you need to remember those who are in spiritual authority over you, those who have been placed to watch over you. And he goes on further in the, the chapter and goes into that, but that's not today's teaching. But he says, remember those who have spoken the word of God to you. Follow their faith considering the outcome of their conduct or considering what it has produced in their own lives, as the MEV says. And so what I want you to, there's, there's two warnings there. There's two commands. That's the word I should use, commands. Number one is you need to follow their faith. But don't follow their faith without considering what it has produced in their own lives. If, if their life is not producing what you want your life producing, if their life isn't going in a direction you want to see your life going, then you probably ought not hitch up your mule to that wagon because it's probably going to take you somewhere you ain't wanting to go. Because if they're not able to produce what you're wanting in their own life, how in the round world are they going to be able to produce it in your life? Now, that puts a very heavy burden upon the men and women of God who preach the word. And so I know that I have preachers in the house, lay preachers and professionals, all the same. They're, we got, praise the Lord, we're a training ground. That's what happens. So hear me, we must take it with great severity, the call and the anointing to declare the word of the Lord. And you need to, before you, I understand in zeal, I laugh at some of the younger preachers. I know I'm a young preacher, but there is younger ones. And so I laugh sometimes at the zeal, not laughing as in making a joke of them, but I see myself. I remember when I thought I knew everything. 
I remember when I got saved full of the Holy Ghost, called to the ministry. I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Can't nobody tell me nothing. And I was ready to grab hold of any pulpit that was ready to let me grab hold of. Until I learned the word. And then I was like, can I resign, please? Would somebody else like to take on? I'll make somebody a good deacon. Let me just teach Sunday school and be somebody's deacon because I don't want to have to stand before God. Because you don't have the freedom of messing up your own life if you're asking people to remember you as you rule over them in the spirit. If you want people to follow you, you got to give them something to follow. You can't lead people who won't follow you. If the, if the production of your faith has failed, why would anybody follow you? I'm not saying perfection in the natural, but a perfection in the faith. Not saying that any of us have perfect lives. We've all got things that we wish were better and our kids don't act right or you know or this that or the other but you better be mindful of what's going on under your roof and you better be mindful of what follows you about in your life if chaos and confusion is in your life in every single turn of the path you better check up because The reason it might be following you is because it might be tied to you. You know, kind of like the toilet paper that sticks to the bottom of your feet. You know what I mean? You're like, what is that? Why why won't it go away? Well, because it's stuck to you. I've seen some of the videos on social media where they come in and they tie, you know, put like a fake snake on the end of a a fishing line and then hook it around somebody's foot or they clip it to their backpack as they're walking by and then they finally look and they see the snake is chasing them and they start running and jumping and hollering and no matter what they do, that snake is there because it's attached to them. Well, in the spirit realm... If chaos and disorder is with you everywhere you go, it could be attached to you. So you better be observing what's going on around you. You better be watching what you are allowing in you. You better watch what's coming out of you so that you can properly examine and you can disconnect whatever has tried to attach itself to you. What is your faith producing? Follow their faith, considering the results it has produced in their lives. So this is where this passage just grabbed hold of me. And I just, I couldn't leave it alone. I couldn't get it away from it. Then you go to verse 8. And it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is immediately tied. And so when you look at the truth, we break up the Bible into chapters and verses, but these letters that were written weren't broken up into chapters and verses. They were paragraphs. They were writings, just as, you know, we would write a letter. And so when you look at the structure of the letter, this is a a connected thought. The writer says, follow those who are teaching the word. Follow their faith. You need to honor them and remember them, but follow their faith. But don't do it without considering what it's producing in their own life because, is how we would say it in the English, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if their life is chaotic, if it's here, if it's there, if it's there, if it's there, and it's just all oh, right, 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 there's a problem because Jesus is a constant Jesus is steady. Jesus is, he is a firm foundation. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Jesus is not bipolar or schizophrenic. He doesn't wake up in a new world every day. He don't change his plan for your life every day. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And he has a plan and a hope for your future. And it is a good one. Huh? You have a hope, and you ha- you have hope. 
Say that again. You have hope because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the stock market might go up and down. Political climate might go left and right. Society moral values goes from the pit to the pitter. <laughs> I made up that word. Y'all knew it, didn't you? I was hoping you thought it was. <laughs> that ain't in the Webster's, I promise you. That's in the RTW. <laughs> Uh, it changes and it seems to get worse and worse. But Jesus, glory, how that ought to just make you happy that I have a hope that I might live in a world that seems to be headed to hell in a handbasket, but I know one who is seated in heavenly places and he has called me to sit with him and he is interceding on my behalf. Look, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It should speak to the volume that our faith life looks like. I didn't say we ain't going to have trouble. I didn't say we're not going to have trials. What I'm telling you is in the midst of every one of them, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is your faith producing something that looks like it was birthed from a God who never changes? If he didn't change, then we shouldn't. If he didn't change, and if he don't change, why do we expect him to change the way we experience him in corporate worship? Well, God don't do it that way no more. Why? Why? Tell me. Take me to the chapter and verse because I take you to one. It's one called Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. And it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Funny thing about forever is, is it don't matter when you read this, forever is still tomorrow. Huh? Well, God don't do that kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, I know it's in the Bible. I know. I know. But, I mean, you mean what? That you don't want the perfect will of God? That's what you mean. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. Your heart screamed it loud, and Jesus heard it all the way to heaven. You better be careful. Your lips might not have ever said it, but your spirit screamed it from the rooftop. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever just had to have a conversation last night with somebody who was deciding they wouldn't want to vote a pastor in they could just run the church themselves <laughs> oh lord help i said okay you need to go and read your bible start in ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse 11 that he gave the apostle the prophet the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher for the equipping or perfecting, whichever translation you want to read, of the saints. Somebody got to be in charge. And you better do it in the order God prescribed it because when you start trying to create your own order, you're going to start reaping what you sow and if you've sown of the flesh, then you're going to reap of the flesh. And then five years from now, you're going to wonder why this church, using that term loosely, turned into a cesspool. It's because you walked outside the will of God. Jesus don't change. He's doing church today just like he did on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God fell and filled them all. And Peter stood on the steps of the temple and he said, repent and be baptized receive the gift of the Holy Ghost it's still the same message today what must we do to be you gotta change that's what repent means 
be baptized. Be baptized unto the, to the body of Christ. Yes, through water baptism, but it's a more spiritual thing that I'm being baptized into Christ, that I'm joining my faith together with him, and I'm going to be buried in the old man, and I'm going to be raised in a newness of life. And then I have a promise that I can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Glory. A subsequent work to salvation. God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about the Holy Ghost that makes you born again. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost that fills you to the overflow, gives you a prayer language, causes you to speak in tongues, give you the perfect chatter room of the throne of God. Glory. If he ain't changed, church don't change. If it was needed in the first century to build the kingdom, it's needed in the 21st century to build the kingdom. We for sure need it today if they needed it then. If it took signs, wonders, and miracles to confirm the word and get people's attention that there is a God and he means business. I've been doing some studying on these gifts of the Spirit and some spiritual authority and fivefold ministry and a return and replacement unto the church. And whew, I'm getting a little nervous. Because if God starts doing stuff the way he wants to do it, my goodness gracious, I can't find room for my traditions and personal preference. Um, well, especially I need an organ. I need somebody to amend me there. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He don't change, y'all. He ain't changed the way he does church. He will still confirm the word with signs and wonders. He will still manifest himself through the gift of the spirits and sp the gift of the gifts, plural, of the spirit, singular. <laughs> My S has got. And speak to us. He will speak to us. Do you realize the Lord has spoke to us today? He used it through a tongue and two interpretation, and both interpretations comment, co complemented one another. That he's drawing you, come to him, trust him, and then he expounded on the second. He said, and bow down. Bow down. So just coming to him all haughty toddy is one thing. But to come to him... And bow down and surrender. You are God. Not my will, but thine be done. Let me come before you and humble myself in the presence of an almighty God. And then to give us a word of wisdom. Operating through a discernment of spirits. That there's a heaviness in this room. Actually, Deb first picked that up. And she says there's a heaviness in people. Got to make a choice. Well, you know why we have to make a choice? is because when the Spirit is trying to oppress and trying to weigh down on us, we have a responsibility to say, uh-uh, no, 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 no depression, no anxiety, no fear, no doubt, no, no, no. You can't hang out here because I, I don't have a spirit of fear, but I got one of power, one of love. I got a sound mind. No, 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 no doubt you can't go because all things are possible with my God. Huh? No, 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 no sin. You can't, you can't come into my mind. Thought you can't have rule and reign because I'm holy because he is holy. See, we have a responsibility. And the word of knowledge through discernment says, look, the Spirit's here trying to quench what's going on. If the people don't get their mind right and open their mouth and worship me, the revival and the release of the Spirit that I have already poured at past tense, it's here. You can't experience it. See, God still operates. You, I love you, Lord. Uh, I praise you. You, you. you can't produce that good of a church service. 
to have this on note. You can read my notes if you, I don't make a lot of notes, but there, this is three hours worth of preaching right here. This one page, that's it. Handwritten. <laughs> Y'all want to, what's the pastor's notes look like out right here? That's it. That's all. I ain't got no more. One page. That would be not even a good paragraph typed out. I can preach it for three hours. I ain't half done. Glory. <laughs> if he don't change, church don't change. And to know that the Lord wanted me to preach that this morning, and then he's going to give a tongue, two interpretations, two word of wisdom and a discerning spirit, all in one service before worship service was even. Glory. Thank you, Lord, for knowing what you wanted to say to your people, to remind them that he is perfect and complete. And because he is perfect and complete, then by faith we are perfect and complete. And don't allow the lie of the enemy to beat you down and change your mind. Walk in the authority that Christ Jesus has given you because if he gets you to believe in that well I'm just a I'm old sinner saved by I, pfft, uh, Jack. no I'm the righteousness of Christ but join heir with Christ Jesus seated together with him in heavenly places he has given us authority to tread on scorpions and serpents and has given us authority over all manners of diseases. And when we lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. When we pray a prayer of faith, they shall be saved. When we cast out demons, they must flee. He'll give us a new tongue and a new creation. Glory! That's the God in whom I serve. And it was the God of the first century. And he's the God of the 21st century. I'm telling you, church, he's perfect and he's complete. And if you're in him and he's in you, you're perfect and complete. Walk in it. Walk in it. Glory. Woo. Hallelujah. Jesus, have mercy. I was supposed to read the whole first chapter of the book of James to you, and we ain't even got out of Hebrews yet. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. I said read it, not preach it. James 1. Just turn over one page. Unless you're in the fire Bible and you've got to turn through that article. <laughs> James chapter 1 I'm just going to start reading in verse 1 James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad my brothers count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations knowing that the trying of your faith develops patience but let patience perfect its work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without criticism, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without wavering. For he who wavers is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed with the wind. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I'm going to pause there for just a minute. Just read to you in Hebrews chapter 13. To follow the faith of those who are teaching the word. But not without considering what it has produced in their own life because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then James goes on and says, are you lacking something? Ask for it. You need wisdom? Ask for it. The Lord will give it. He is not a respecter of person. He is not going to, oh, well, I'm going to give you some and I'm going to give you. No, it is available to whomever will ask if. There's one more. And if you waver 
not. It's that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and for he is constant. And so if we have the mind of God, while our situations might be crazy, we are constant because we are in Christ and Christ is in us. If you lack wit, I'm, I'm going to read this portion to you again because I want you to look at the words. You know, the word matters. Verse 2. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The New King James says various trials, and that's more accurate. It's not talking about a temptation of sin, but it's talking about situations and circumstances that's causing you issue. Count it all joy. Because in these situations, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my paraphrase here, this will try your faith. It will make you put your faith to work. And when you put your faith to work, when you exercise your faith, just like any muscle in your body, if you exercise it, it will grow and gain strength. And so while I always had an arm muscle, I can make it bigger and it can lift more if I'm willing to exercise it. So when you get saved, when the Holy Ghost of God makes you born again, you are deposited a measure of faith because you can't cry out to Jesus without the help of the Holy Spirit. So there is a measure of faith deposited into each and every one of you but through the working of the Spirit and the exercising of that faith, that faith muscle will grow and can accomplish more but that is dependent upon you. So count it joy when you have opportunities to put your faith to work. And I know it don't sound fun. You know what also don't sound fun to me? Going out here and running five miles. But you know what that do? That'd make my leg stronger and my waist smaller. <laughs> uh, I can't fuss about having a big waist. Actually, my legs are pretty strong because I got to tote all this around all day. You know? <laughs> You tote 270 pounds around 24-7. You're going to have some really nice calves, I promise you. <laughs> oh, I don't mean to have levity here, but I want you to really understand this situation. I want you to see it in a natural so that it can make sense in your spirit. That's how you can count it joy when you find yourself in these hard situations where you have to exercise faith. No, the situation isn't fun. No, you don't have to be happy about being in the situation. But in your spirit, when you can exercise your faith, there is an opportunity for your faith to be increased. And if your faith is increased, then you can experience God in a way you've never experienced Him before. And you began to see things you never seen before because you now got a faith mode bigger than it used to be and that's why you can count it all joy but let patience perfect its work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing people don't like when I teach this you go to the Greek you look at different manuscripts, you look at different contemporary translations, you when you read comment it's hard to theologize how literal this verse is away. It, 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 it just says what it says. It says that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God, I know me, <laughs> and I ain't perfect or complete, and I'm lacking a few things. Jesus says, yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, you, you got flaws. Yeah, you, you got some personality quirks. Yeah, you got some things that need a little bit of work. 
but you died and I've made all things new and if you died and you've offered yourself a living sacrifice which is your reasonable service you are now alive in me and I'm alive in you and I am perfect and complete and he lacks nothing you are perfect and complete and lack nothing if you are in Christ Colossians chapter 2 Colossians 2 verse Ah, uh, let's, I was going to read, let's read it anyway. Colossians 2 verse 6. I was going to just read verse 10 because that's the main one, but let's pick up in Colossians 2 verse 6. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith as you have been taught and abounding with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone captivate you through philosophies and vain deceit in the tradition of men and the elementary principle of the world and not after Christ. For in him lives all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all authority and power. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised with him through the faith of the power of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has resurrected together with him, having forgiven you all sins. He blotted out the handwriting and ordinances that was against us and contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed authorities and powers, he made a show in them openly, triumphing over them by the cross. You are perfect and complete, lacking nothing in Him. In Him. Where our lacking shows up, where our imperfections and our incompletion shows up, is when we get in our flesh and we begin to walk outside of Christ. So when those things start showing up, we got to get our hearts and minds right and start walking in the Spirit. We got to get back in Christ who lacks nothing. Who lacks nothing. I love in verse 15, he says, having disarmed authorities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them by the cross. It's like not only did he conquer death, hell, and a grave, but when he was ascending to the right hand of the Father, he didn't do this, but I vision Jesus doing this. He says, nana, nana, boo, boo. You know what I mean? It's make a show of them openly. You know what I mean? Ha ha, you thought you had me. Nana, nana, boo boo. And so I, that's how I have to think about it in my spirit. When, when in my flesh I fail God, in my flesh when I feel like I've done too much, I might as well just give it up. God can't use me. The spirit of God rises up and says, me and says no, that's a lie of the enemy. And on the way to heaven, Jesus Jesus looked at that devil that's whispering in your ear and said, Nana, nana, boo, boo, you thought you had him, but he's mine. Glory. And he says that for you too. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are perfect and complete and lack nothing. Ha. Glory. 
New King James made a public spectacle of them. Nana, nana, boo, boo. I wish I had a more theological term for you, but. <laughs> uh, now this morning, I want you to know that you are perfect and complete, not because of who you are or what you've done. You are perfect and complete because of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has done. You don't have to work your way to victory. You don't have to. You, it's, it's not depending upon your works. What you have to do is flex your faith muscle. And you got to flex it in Christ Jesus, knowing that because of who he is and what he's, because he had made a show of them openly, that I now get to walk in a victory. Because I didn't do anything to earn it, but place my faith in Jesus. And he freely gave it to me. Amen? Hallelujah. Stand to your feet this morning. Perfect and complete. Perfect and complete. We've had some wonderful time in the altar and in the Spirit of God this morning. But I believe oftentimes... We get caught up in emotion, we get caught up in the moment, and we think we've had an experience with the Lord when really we just kind of had a little emotional fit. But this morning, I want us just here in the still and the calm and the quiet to exercise our faith a little bit. We all have things in our flesh and in our lives and that could be better. Attitudes, and I don't have to be bad sin stuff, but attitudes can mess up just as much as drug addiction. Gossip can do more damage than alcohol. We all have things. Unbridled tongue will do all kinds of things. So this morning, I just want us to take a few moments in the quiet. Say, it's awkward. Church needs more awkward moments. We don't need to always be dependent upon the piano or the bass drum to take us into the presence of the Lord. We need to just be able to realize that really he's here anyway. But then we have a promise that because there were a multitude of us gathered here, Amen. that he is in this room. And so think of it in the natural. If Jesus manifested in bodily form, walked in this room and stood down here and said, if you have a need, come to me. How many of you would still be in your seat? And how many of you would trust that he would meet that need. Well, the word of God tells us he's in this room. And so with the same faith of a manifest bodily Jesus standing at this front, know that he is in this place. And so whatever that need is that you would bring to him if he was standing down here, I want you to right now by faith to declare that whatever that is, that at this moment it is now perfect and complete. In Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm going to Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time, and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.